Hello, my name is Darcy Copeland. Um, I'm a composer based um, now in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. I think for me, I've uh, my body of work has been um, really concerned with um, palpability and um, creating a sensation um, in the mind of the um, performer and also in the listener um, and sort of trying to translate that um, into a um, performance, into a piece. And um, I've also uh, been really interested in my work recently in um, ecology um, and sonic activism, which has been um, a theme in my work in the past um, couple of years. Good. Thank you for that. So Darcy, what is your notion of substance as a composer? For me, um, the substance of music, I think, has a lot to do with um, this sort of, um, you know, palpability of sound. Like I said, that's something that my work um, is really concerned with. And um, I tend to approach music from a sort of um, intuitive, more emotive um, side of thinking. And for me, that's very connected um, to the physical body. And so um, I tend to try to cultivate um, almost a sense of tactility um, in sound. Um, and so for me, um, substance as a composer has to do with, um, you know, almost being an architect or a sculptor of this sort of multi-dimensional space that can create this almost like the sensation of a moment um, in time that you can touch. Thank you. Darcy, what is your notion of impact as a composer? Um, I think for me, well, I think that there's multi um, levels of thinking um, when it comes to impact, right? There's sort of this uh, more existential question of global impact, you know, what is the impact of music generally, or what is my impact? Um, what are my contributions to um, not only this field, but also the world? Um, which can be kind of heavy. And then there's also this idea of um, individual impact. You know, what is the impression that my work leaves um, both on myself, on performers and, the, and on listeners? And I think in both cases, it's, it can be sort of difficult to address, but um, you know, I think that one of the most powerful um, things about sound and music as an expressive medium is that it exists in temporal space as we do um, and in physical space and so and it's sort of this um, you know it, it's this enveloping force um, and so I I think that that lends it a sort of power of um, shaping how we perceive relationships and how we perceive um, space and how we perceive connection um, to space and time and through that um, you know giving us different perspectives of new ways of listening um, not only to each other um, you know, or ourselves even our interior space but also our environment um, human and non-human and so um, I think for me both on the global scale and the individual scale um, of impact, I think that that's that's sort of where I tend to to think is that sense of um, you know new perspectives of of listening and new ways of attention. Good, thank you. So, Darcy, what is your notion of responsibility as a composer? Um, this is something that I've been grappling with a lot um, in these past few years. You know, um, and obviously it's. You know, it's been something I've been asking myself and we've just gone recently through a global collective traumatic experience, I think, and that really um, pushed me to question, you know, again, I think this sort of ties in with the question of impact as well, you know, what is my purpose? What is music's purpose? You know, what am, what am I doing here? Um, and do artists have a responsibility, you know, um, and I think in some ways, I mean, yes, I think that we do in many ways, um, you know, and it's obviously very um, complicated and, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. And um, I think that for me, you know, I've been really interested in um, ecology and that's in climate change. And so that's something I've been really um, passionate about. And that's not to say that I necessarily want all of my works to be inherently political or that I even think that 
you know, that will lead to any sort of um, grand scale of change. But I do think that there's, you know, this sort of um, responsibility there, at least for me personally, um, to, you know, use sound and use this sort of sense of palpability and these ways of listening to um, attune us to, to different ways of um, interacting um, both with ourselves and with the environment. And I also think that there's, you know, a responsibility to, you know, a composer has to themselves. Um, you know, and that sounds maybe perhaps a bit self-serving, especially given what I just, you know, said about the sort of greater impact. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of times, you know, this hierarchy in this field of, you know, what music is or isn't or how a score should look. And I think that there's, you know, a composer or any artist has a responsibility to themselves to sort of listen to their intuition and their sort of um, interiority and sort of expose that to the world and bring that forward. Um, because I think that there's, you know, there's almost always something of value um, there, at least for someone. And, you know, along that same line, I think that there's also a responsibility that all of us have in this field of music to um, sort of question, again, these hierarchies, you know, and um, the ways that our field is very, you know, much in, embedded with colonialism and these sort of um, hierarchical ideas of who a composer is or should be or how they should behave or who a performer is and should be or how they should behave and and the listeners and you know all of these different levels of engagement that make a music performance but you know and what are the roles there what are the power dynamics and i think that we all have a responsibility to be aware of that and sort of challenge that where we can thank you darcy in terms of subject matter what are you dealing with in your opus generally or perhaps uh, specifically in your piece Blue et Apuria? Yeah, well, I think generally I, um, well, in terms of materials anyway, I, I tend to approach sound very texturally and very timbrely. And for me, sound and um, tactility are very much one and the same and sound and movement. And so I tend to sort of think about that when I'm composing and um, when I'm like sort of coming up with ideas for pieces, it usually comes from a very embodied place. Um, and I think that that's something that can kind of be sensed in a lot of my works. And, you know, I tend to think again about texture and timbre and density um, more so than I think about melody or harmony. And I think of these sort of, you know, um, uh, polarities between sounds and Actually, I don't even know if polarities is the right word because that already sounds too limiting to sort of, you know, put it on a binary. But rather, I think of this sort of like sphere of um, relationships between material and like how one can transform into the next or how one can abruptly change from one to the next or what happens when I'm in this place here and then I suddenly am over here or if I gradually move like along this um, trajectory um, to get from this place to this place. And so and I think of this sort of fluidity of sounds um, and their sort of fragility um, and sort of ephemeral qualities. And in my cello solo, Bluet um, Aporia, I think that that's really, I think that that's really palpable, um, these sort of juxtapositions um, between material and also the ways that they sort of bleed into one another, um, sometimes seamlessly, sometimes not. Um, and I also think, again, the presence of the physical body um, is another parameter that's really present in that piece in particular, you know, and in, um, you know, with these gestures, I think that you can really, like, get a sense of not just the sound that's happening, but also the the quality of the, the physical act of making the sounds. At least for me, I think that that's really present in this piece and that's really, you know, something that I wanted to be at the forefront. Um, and especially dealing with the particular subject matter of that piece, which is, um, you know, it's based off of a book um, called The Bluettes by Maggie Nelson, which is this really beautiful, um, like, prose, memoir, poetry, you know, this sort of 
again, like this amorphous almost thing um, that's all, de all dealing with, um, you know, different perspectives and the sort of relationship she has with depression and melancholy um, and also love and, um, you know, this sort of duality of, of that dichotomy. And so that's what I was trying to tackle with this piece. And so it was a very personal piece for me to write. And, um, you know, it was really important to get these sort of different angles and sort of almost explore this, you know, this sort of non, you know, nonsensical relationship with this sensation of melancholy, right? I mean, we think of melancholy as being inherently negative and something we don't want to experience, but there's also something really beautiful in it. And there's sort of this, um, you know, this evidence of, of love there that I really wanted to explore. And I, you know, she ends the book, you know, this, this book is all about her, you know, fascination with this sensation. And, um, you know, she personifies it in the form of like the color blue and this attraction she has towards it. And no matter how, you know, she tries to get away from it, it always finds her and she always finds comfort in it somehow. And she ends the book with this phrase that I thought was really beautiful, that she wants to be a student, not of longing, but of light. And so, yeah, I think that that was something that I really tried to um, really capture in that sort of interiority and that sort of relationship um, in this piece and in the sounds. Thank you, Darcy. Thanks. <laughs>